right, everybody. Greetings on this Sabbath day, this Bible study day. I say my counter's not working right. Well, I'm getting older, and a lot of things aren't quite working as well as they used to. My eyesight is not as good as it was a year ago. It's diminished. I'm getting a cataract on my right eye, and my left eye is very astigmatic, and and I've lost the central vision from the left eye because of a, well, something on the, uh, the retina. Because of the diabetic eye condition, the, uh, the pupil has a little spot right in the middle, and so I have peripheral vision, and I can see, but I can't make out fine distinctions with the left eye, so I use my right eye. And the right eye I use for reading, and I use glasses for driving. I'm still able to drive legally, but it's, you know, I wish my eyes were a little better, especially my right eye, because it's kind of decreased from, from 220 or 225 to about 230. And uh, I know what people are talking about these days when they talk about cataracts, because I'm in the process of of forming one, I guess, and uh, I might need to have something done about it in a year or two. <clears throat> we'll have to wait and see. I mentioned in the prayer, opening the Bible study, that we've been having some trials this week, and uh, they're not health trials, so to speak. Right now the trials are mainly involving the uh, triumphpro.org website which kind of came up unexpectedly I have to say I was not expecting this but I got a memo or email from Darren Clark on Sunday I guess he sent it on the Sabbath but I got it on Sunday and read it and uh, lo and behold the domain name for the triumphpro.org site uh, expired on Sabbath and he did not renew it and he sent me the email saying he felt I should renew it because it was in my name and belongs to me and uh, so I tried to renew it thinking well he's always renewed it in the past the last year uh, he was talking about maybe my taking it over the domain name but I tried to renew it on Sunday and it would not renew. And so I wrote to him and sent him an email, called him on the phone, and he said to do this and do that. And uh, I tried all of that and nothing worked. And I wrote him back. And I, I contacted my domain name providers and they said, well, there's nothing they can do now to Take that domain name because it's in limbo. It's 30 days grace period where I, where I could reinstall it by using the domain name provider that Darren used. But during this 30 days, nobody else can do it. They said they couldn't do it. And I checked two or three different uh, providers. None of them, they all said no, nothing they can do. So that means it's down and right now there's a bunch of gobbledygook on that internet site. The site is still in existence, but it's not under triumphpro.org right now. That name is detached from it. And the site can be accessed by just going to your web browser and typing in the IP number for the site, which is 96.0.42.0. And then hit the arrow or go or enter and it take you right there to the site if you want to listen to audios that we've had in the past or other things on the site. Well, I tried to communicate this to Darren, my frustration getting this done. I said, well, why don't I said, look, why don't you make it simple, Darren, and you just renew it with the provider you have. You know, it's only it's only nineteen twenty dollars. Why don't you just renew it? And then I'll get my 
uh, decide to transfer it over. Well, he hasn't responded to that request, and uh, he didn't seem to want to do that. He said, well, don't go through my provider. That creates problems and complications, which makes me, makes me wonder, well, what are the problems? What are the complications? Has he got other problems with them that I don't know about? Or, uh, you know, he says it's not the money. The money's not the issue. So what is the issue? Well, I don't know. I said, well, look, they said, your site said I could change it if I could give them the first six letters of five numbers of the credit card and the last four numbers on, on the credit card currently used to pay that bill. That'd be Darren's credit card. So I told him that. He didn't want to give me that. And I said, the other thing I can do is give me the password to the account on the site, and I can go to the account and I can change the credit card. Well, he hasn't got back to me on that yet. So in the meantime, a whole week drags by, and we're no closer to a solution except verbally than what we were before. So I honestly don't know, brethren, why we had this difficulty. <coughs> I hope that Darren is uh, okay and that he's going to be faithful to the work and not pull a John Kaiser or try to you know go off on his own because he has given no indication of that but yet why are we having this simple problem of communication you know there, there's between people who are converted there should be no problem. There should be a willingness just to give and serve and do whatever is required within God's law to get the problem solved and not to raise obstacles or be uh, <laughs> obstreperous, Kathy says, or or uh, defiant or or hesitant or or even rebellious. Bible tells us about King Saul that Saul was appointed the king of Israel by God and anointed by God but then Samuel the prophet was to meet Saul at a certain place to do a sacrifice and Samuel was late and Saul was very concerned that the people were going to drift away from him he's lacking self confidence and he was suggested to him that he should just go ahead and do the sacrifice himself as the king. <coughs> so Saul did that and he offered the sacrifice and then Samuel came up and saw the sacrifice was already offered. That was the priest's job not the king's job. Saul had violated God's command. And he said, why have you done this? And he said, well the people I feared the people, they were going to depart from me. Well, they did the sacrifice, and then God sent Saul on a campaign to eradicate the Amalekites, who are the vicious enemies of God's people. And they still exist today, by the way, in the Middle East, and a lot of them are Palestinians. But Saul was to eradicate the Amalekites and kill all their men, women, children, and even their animals and livestock. So Saul went to war with the Amalekites, as God commanded, and slew a lot of them. But he saved the sheep and the cows, and he saved the king alive. And Samuel came up to him afterwards and said, What is this I hear? Because Saul said to Samuel, well, Look, Samuel, look, I obeyed the word of the Lord. I've slaughtered the Amalekites. And then Samuel said, oh, is that right? Well, what is this bleating I hear with my ears? Is that sheep? Well, the mooing, is that those cows? And Saul had to backtrack and said, well, yeah. Uh, we did save the best of the animals alive. And Samuel said, hear the word of the Lord, Saul. The Lord has taken the kingdom, the kingdom away from you. He's taking the authority away from you because you have 
transgressed the commandment of the Lord. He said, Stubbornness is as witchcraft. Well, let me just read that because I can't remember the exact phraseology there, but 1 Samuel chapter 15, I believe. It says in verse 9, Saul and the people spared Agag, the king, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good. And they were unwilling to utterly destroy them as God had commanded. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. See, Saul and the people were in cahoots on this. And the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, verse 10 of chapter 15, at first Samuel, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel didn't want to lose Saul. He didn't want to lose him as a friend. He didn't want to lose him as a companion. He wanted the, the best for Saul. But Saul was not doing the right thing. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet with Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself, and he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. See, Saul was becoming proud, vain, and lifted up in his own estimation. He set up a monument for himself. The great Saul. God loves humility. And those who follow him in humility and meekness and service. In God's sight, a true king is a servant of the people, and especially a servant of God and God's work. And Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you of the Lord, Samuel. Look at me, I perform the commandment of the Lord. See, Saul thought he'd done right. He thought he was okay. He didn't understand really emotionally and intellectually what obedience really meant. He thought he'd obeyed. He was full of proud and vanity. But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul had to take a step back and said, Well, now yeah, they, that is the people, have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, Samuel. And the rest we've utterly destroyed. But that's not what God commanded. They went by their own human emotion and human feelings and uh, mental aberrations and thoughts of their own mind, not what God said. God says obedience is better than sacrifice. <coughs> So verse 16, Samuel said to Saul, Well, be quiet. I'll tell you what the Lord has said to me last night. And Saul said, Speak on. I don't know what Saul expected at this point. Praise? To be patted on the back? Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel when you were small and humble? Didn't God bless you and anoint you to be the king over Israel? And now the Lord has sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed, until they are exterminated, my margin says. 
Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord your God? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord, greedily swooping on the cattle and the sheep and the spoil, the plunder of the war? But Saul, taken aback, <coughs> Saul said to Samuel, but, 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 wait a minute, Samuel. Don't condemn me yet. But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I went on the mission he commanded me and sent me, and I brought back Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites as a nation or fighting uh, force that wasn't true by the way like I said earlier there are many Amalekites alive today and there were Amalekites alive hundreds of years later in the kingdom of Persia Haman who sought to destroy all the Jews under King Xerxes as the book of Esther tells us was an Amalekite a descendant of this very King Agag but Saul said to Samuel, But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen. Well, he is the king, right? He's supposed to be in charge of the people. He let them do it, so he's responsible. Like President Harry S. Truman used to say, The buck stops in the White House. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. He also used to say, when you're responsible, you're responsible to do what your responsibility is. If you can't do it, give it to somebody else, but don't stand in the way. Don't stand in the way of God's work going forward. Don't make a big mountain out of molehills. If you got to pay a price to renew a domain name, just pay it. Don't make it a stumbling block. A stumbling block, an obstacle to the work of God going forward. God will find a way around it. We'll find ways around it. But the one who causes the stumbling block is going to be crushed and stumble. Saul said that it was the people's fault. They encouraged me to keep the sheep and the oxen and the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. But it was the sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. He still had an excuse, worming his way around, you see, trying to finagle a way to escape the punishment, the wrath of God. And Samuel replied to Saul and said, Well, look, has the Lord as great a design or delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord which do you think is more important Saul giving an offering or a burnt offering or just obeying the words of God what do you think he likes the most behold he says to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed the word of the Lord than the fat of many rams for rebellion failure to do God's work failure to carry out God's plan and purpose failure to obey which is rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft it's like consorting with demons and he said stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. To be stubborn in God's sight is to be filled with iniquity and of being a worshiper of idols. Idolatry. And Samuel said to Saul, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being the king over Israel. You rejected Saul. It's too late for you now. You've gone too far. 
You're rejected. And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. So his God was the people. He was seeking to please the people. They wanted the sheep and the oxen and Saul said, all right. He didn't fear God, he feared the people. He said so himself. His own mouth condemned him. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. Now we said in verse 25, Now therefore, Samuel, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord in your presence with you at my right hand so the people will know that all is well. There's nothing we can't get over here <laughs> or get past. But Samuel said to Saul, I'm sorry, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord. And you're still not repentant. He still wasn't willing to go out and slay the sheep and the oxen and to do what God said. If he was repentant, he could have still done it. But he wanted a pass, a bypass. <coughs> He wanted to be forgiven without real repentance. That's the way a lot of people are today. They want their sins forgiven, but they don't want to give them up. They don't want to repent. They don't want to take themselves in their hands and crush out the iniquity that's in their members. They want to have their sins and God's blessing too. Like the Catholic Church, just go ahead and sin. Just pay the priest a little extra money and you get an indulgence. Mm -hmm. So you can send and buy your way into heaven without giving up your sin. That's the devil's doctrine. The doctrine of demons. And so Samuel said, no, I can't go back with you for you've rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king. It's over with, Saul. Get it through your head. And Samuel turned around to go away, just to leave quietly. And Saul seized the edge of his garment, his robe, trying to make him stay, and the garment tore. And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours, who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie or repent or relent or go back on his word. For he is not a man that he should relent or go back on his word. Is it you? You passed the point of no return, Saul. You've gone too far. You should have repented, but you didn't. And now the kingdom is stripped from your hand. Well, Saul still could have repented. He could have been willing to give up the kingdom and just humble himself. And God would have forgiven him, and he would have been back in God's good graces if he really repented. But you know the story, Saul just got worse and worse. And the Spirit of God departed from him, and the evil spirits began to trouble him. And then he began to try to kill David, who was a man after God's own heart, out of envy and jealousy and spite. Notice Saul's attitude in verse 30. Then he said to Samuel, I have sinned, yet honor me now, show me honor. Please, before the elders of the people and before Israel and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. And then Samuel said, hoping Saul was going to repent really from his heart. Samuel wasn't rejecting him. He was still open towards Saul's 
willingness to repent if he would. So Samuel then said to Saul, Bring Agag, the king of the Amalekites, here to me. So Agag came up to him cautiously. And Agag said to himself, Surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Saul wouldn't do it, the people wouldn't do it, but Samuel the prophet did. And then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his own house of Gilgal of Saul. And verse 35 says, Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul the king over Israel. He turned out not to be as humble as he had looked in the beginning. <coughs> Saul turned out to be a man of great pride and ego unwillingness to be corrected unwilling to repent unwilling to take instruction unwilling to listen. He had to be his own boss, his own chief, in charge of his own destiny. What he failed to realize was none of us is in charge of our own destiny. Almighty God is in charge of our destiny and our future and our life. God is the one who appoints and sometimes disappoints or unappoints God is the one who raises people up and brings them down. He's the one who sets up kings and takes down kings and offices in the church, spiritual offices. God's the one who ordains people to the ministry. Not men, not other men, but God chooses his servants. As Christ said to his disciples in John 15, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. There's a lot of people out there today claiming to serve God, claiming to be doing a great work for God, and they're all divided up. You know, I had a got a phone call this, not a phone call, I got a letter this week from a prisoner. I think he was in Florida, I'm not really sure. And he was saying he's sampled the different ministries that have reached him in prison. Gerald Flurry in the Philadelphia Church of God, the United Church of God, the Living Church of God, Rod Roderick C. Meredith and others, I guess. And he's Herbert Armstrong, the old worldwide church of God. And he said, and your and then, then I got prophecy flash in your ministry and your articles. And he said, I was disappointed in all of them. And I was still searching and I found your ministry in your magazine and he said you're so much smaller than Flurry's group you're maybe one one hundredth as big he said but but you've got the truth you've got the truth all these others are, are bigger and have more people but you're teaching the truth he wants more of it. And I was thinking that. Then I got this magazine. A friend of mine sent me. He's, he's a member of the church. And he has a friend of his who was a minister in the old Worldwide Church of God. His name was Dale Schurter. And Dale Schurter was into agriculture and farming according to God's ways, allegedly. 
natural organic farming. And so he and my friend were buddies and friends because he's into farming and raising goats and having a garden and supports he and his wife there in near, near Spokane, Washington. And uh, he found out Dale Schroeder had be, been appointed to be number two man in the so-called Restored Church of God, led by David Pack, a former minister in the Worldwide Church of God. And then he was with Meredith in the Living Church for a while. And then he started his own church called the Restored Church. And this magazine my friend sent to me, he read it and underlined passages in it. It was about 50 pages thick, heavy duty, full color articles on paper. And in the mag, the whole magazine was touting the brilliance, I would say, of the work of David Pack, another minister in the stripe an image of Herbert Armstrong, another know-it-all authoritarian. And he had an article in there about the new headquarters for God's work being built in Wadsworth, mm -hmm. Ohio. And they had a beautiful picture, an architect's drawing of the headquarters building as it's going to look if and when they ever build it looking a lot like with pillars all around it, a lot like the old Worldwide Church of God Ambassador College headquarters church building that had the fluted columns with the egrets in front of it, the auditorium of the church, I should say. Also used for church services in the Pasadena, California. This is very reminiscent and I could only, and then with his picture, David Pack's picture scattered throughout the magazine. I goes, here's another Herbert Armstrong wannabe. They all want to follow in his footsteps and be like him. David Pack and Gerald Flurry, they're all trying to beat each other in this Keystone Cops comedy. Who's the most rootin' tootinest? Preacher of them all. They all, he, he thinks he's an apostle. I guess Meredith is a little too humble to call himself an apostle because Herbert ordained him as an evangelist. Be that as it may, all these people are in competition. Here we are, brethren, this little tiny group, tiny church. We can't compare with them. I don't even try to compare with them. All I want to do is serve God do his work and teach his truth. They got the money, they got the buildings, they've got television and radio time, but where's the truth? Where's the gospel? As the old ad says, where's the beef? Where's the meat? They're preaching baby food. We're preaching strong meat. Paul says those who are grown up and mature in the faith need strong meat to grow, and not just more pablum and baby food. Well, so we've had a few trials and problems this week with the uh, triumphpro.org domain name, and I'm still hopeful we'll get it resolved if I can come to a meeting of minds with Darren. All he needs to do, in my opinion, is just pay the bill and then send it to me and I'll go ahead and reimburse him. But if he can't work through that registrar for some reason, then I don't think there's anything I can do unless he sends me the password so I can do it myself. Because all the other registrar companies for domain names say there's nothing they can do since that account is now in limbo. They can't just take it over. It's in limbo. It's got 30 days to run mm -hmm. and then the whole world can jump in and try to get this 
triumphpro.org. Well, we'll see what happens. But I just really do hope and pray Darren will do the right thing. And we will see. In the meantime, God has blessed and opened the doors so that we can continue doing radio, uh, put on, putting all of our audio files on triumphpro.info, which is, by the way, the major website for Triumph Prophetic Ministries now. It's triumphpro.info. That is the number one site. The one that I manage here at home is triumphpro.com. And it keeps up with things because I keep it up to date. But the real, what what is the word? Uh, mm -hmm. The, 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 the real website that is the focus of the work to appeal to the public is triumphpro.info and they have the audio files and the video DVD files of all of our Bible studies there on dot .info you want to watch this Bible study on DVD or previous ones, they're archived right there on triumphpro.info. You want to hear audio programs of the Bible studies, they're right there on triumph.info, as well as our articles and search engines to find articles and any, any subject you want to find that I've written about. You know, it is our premier flagship website triumphpro.info it's up to date and it's very up to date in <coughs> in uh, the way it's been put together my original website the triumphpro.com is still available I still keep it up there because it's like a backup in case anything happens to info last summer info was shut down for about a week or so because of I don't know what the problem was, but it just had to, it got shut down with other websites. It's up there on a cloud. They call it a cloud. My website is basically on my computer, and I upload it as I need to to the internet, the, the cloud. It's called the internet. So if you want to see what's available, go to triumphpro.info and you know, you want to hear these live Bible study streamings, you can do it right on triumphpro.info, but also on triumphpro.org, where a lot of people went. And we do hope to improve that function in the future. And God willing, we are going to improve it and have more audios. And, and I may start doing about an hour-long audio broadcast every day keeping people up with the news and uh, maybe this this year also we'll get into video broadcasts every week if not every day like a news program a prophecy program with interviews and whatever God opens the door for us to do <clears throat> We're also now, by the way, in case you didn't know this, taking our weekly Bible study sermon notes, which Kathy types up, to about a seven, eight, nine page article covering the detail, details of each week's Bible study. And uh, we're converting that into a PDF file and then uploading that to the website as the weekly Sabbath blog, which means talk, the Bible study blog. And if people want to see the Bible study and read it as it's summarized on the, on the blog, they can just go to the website and click on Bible study blog for the week 
on both triumphpro.com and also triumphpro.info. So you can get that if you want to read it. You know, some people are more visual, they want to read. Others want to hear with the ear, and that's very persuasive to them. And still other people like to see with their eyes the show itself. And then, you know, we're all different. Some are auditory, some are visual, and, and some are more mental. I think the mental ones like to read because then you can read and analyze and think about what you're reading. If you're watching a show, you can't stop and re-reel it, or turn it back, you have to just keep going with the flow. If you're watching like a TV show or a Bible study. And if you have an audio, you have to listen to the audio and just as it goes. If it's a, a MP3 CD or something you download from the uh, internet. Now somebody wrote to me that recently, although also <coughs> said the reason they like the old tapes, Bible study tapes, is because if you see something or hear something you want to have repeated, you can just stop the tape right there, back it up, and hear it again. It's not so easily done with either a DVD or a, a CD, but with the old tapes you can just back it up and and, and, and hear it. That's, <coughs> that's how Cappy types up the uh, Bible studies each week. She has the tape player and she plays the tape a while, listens to it, and then summarizes it on the uh, on the computer as an article. And she does a very fine, earnest, loyal job of that because it takes seven to ten hours or longer for her to transcribe a whole Bible study. You know, seven, eight pages, single spaced. You have to think about what you're typing. It takes time. You have to hear the tape, and think about what you're going to put down, and then type it out. And it, and it takes time. And maybe look up the text, look up the scripture to verify the scripture, and or the other source. You know, all this takes time, and I'm sure that you all appreciate it. And now that we're putting those up on the Bible study, Bible study blogs up on the internet sites, uh, everybody can have access to them. They, ori they were originally done for the deaf brethren, so the deaf brethren could see the Bible studies. Well, they can't hear them, and they're missing out, but then they could see them. And we sent them out, and somebody wrote back to us and said, well, these are... These are really very good. Uh, you should post them on your, the website so everybody can share them. And then we have been sending them to some prisoners as well as the deaf people. And, and I finally got to my mind the, a few months ago, the, yeah, that's right. This woman was right. I should just put them up on the website. Because some of these Bible studies are really very introspective and very intense like counting the Omer and different lessons we learn. And so I put them up there and I hope they will pay off and people will really uh, tune in and make use of them. You know, we are living in the days of apostasy. The whole world is falling away from God and His truth. Our whole nation is in rebellion against God today. We're living today like in the, it says in the book of Judges in ancient Israel. Let's just turn there for a, a moment and compare this to our day today because all of these problems we're having, they were preordained, they were forecast in advance. And in Judges, the final verse of chapter 21, Verse 24 and 25, it says, So the children of Israel departed from there at that time, 
every man to his tribe and family. They went out from there, every man to his inheritance. Verse 25, And in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And you read the book of Judges, you find out that was the bloodiest period in the history of Israel. In chapter... Just to give you an example. This, this whole book is about Israel obeying God in one generation and then disobeying God and turning to evil in the next generation and going into captivity. Then they'd obey God and repent and cry out to God and he would forgive them and bring a judge to rescue them and they'd be all right for a while until the judge died probably, and then they return back to their evil ways and the worship of Baal and the prostitute gods of the pagans. And they do evil and God would send them into captivity again. And then again they'd cry out to him and they'd be forgiven and brought back and refurnished in the land until the judge died to deliver them then they turn back to their evil ways again. And this happened all through the book of Judges. And chapter 4 gives, a, gives us an example. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In the days of uh, one king, it wasn't a king, I should say, but a judge, Eglon's servants, uh, an Israelite by the name of Ehud, was a, was a messenger who took the tribute of the Israelites to King Eglon of the Moabites because the Moabites were ruling Israel. After the Israelites had served Cush and Rishathaim for eight years and they cried out to the Lord, Judges 3 verse 9, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them. It was Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Othniel, and he judged Israel, and went out to war, and crushed Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. Then the land had rest for forty years, verse 11 says. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Othniel, by the way, was another name for Jabez. I believe Jabez, the one whose prayer was heard in the book of Chronicles, who said, Lord, bless me. Oh, bless me indeed and enlarge my territory and don't let me cause harm to any man or don't let any harm come to me and my family. And it says, and the Lord granted what Jabez requested. Well, the commentary showed Jabez was another name for Othniel. The school of writers that preserved the Old Testament scriptures. Well then Othniel died it says and the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon king of Moab. The Lord strengthened him against Israel because they had done evil in his sight. And look at our country today. Why are we having all these problems? Why are we having IRS gate and AP, Associated Press scandal gate? Why is the government eavesdropping on all of our telephone conversations and emails throughout the country today? Why are we having drones flying in America? Surveillance over the American people. 
Why did Benghazi occur? In Libya, where our ambassador was killed, and our government still covering it up. Why are all these evil things happening to our country and the economy is going down the toilet? And more people are out of work. Well, our nation is doing evil in the sight of the Lord. The whole nation is doing evil. The people have turned their backs on God. I don't blame Obama. I don't blame his wife, Michelle. I don't blame Hillary Clinton, who was the Secretary of State when Benghazi occurred. These people would not be in their current jobs unless God allowed them to rise up to those positions. God is allowing it because our people have turned their backs on him. And now we're going into captivity. The lesson of the book of Judges is disobey God and go into captivity. Become a slave and be punished and serve other people. So God raised up and strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, to, against Israel. So Eglon gathered to himself the people of Ammon and, and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel and took possession of Jericho, the city of Palms. And the children of Israel served Eglon for 18 years of tribulation. But then when they cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer. First, though, they have to cry out to God. You know, that's what's lacking today. Not enough people are crying out to God. They're still trying to work it out themselves. They chant at the ball games and Well, what is it they chant about America? They say, God bless America. But he's not listening because they're sinning in their hypocrisy. They're sinning. So when they cried out to the Lord, though, he delivered them and sent Ehud, <coughs> the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. And by him, the children of Israel used to send tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab. He was the messenger, the courier, the tribute carrier. So Ehud made himself a dagger, double-edged dagger, about 18 inches long, and fastened it under his clothing on his right thigh. And he brought the tribute into Eglon, the king of Moab, as he always did. Eglon was a very fat man, the scripture says. And when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute into the king. And the king was feeling pretty good after seeing all this wealth and tribute. But Ehud himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And the king said, Keep silence. And all that were attending the king went out from him, all of his couriers and people hanging around the throne. They all departed the room. So Ehud came up to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. And then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So Ehud, or Eglon, arose from his seat. And Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into Eglon's belly. And even the hilt of the sword or dagger went in after the blade. And the fat closed over the blade 
for he did not draw the dagger out of his belly and just left it there and the entrails of the king began to pour out of his belly onto the floor. Then Ehud went out through the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. When he had gone out and made his escape, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said he's probably attending to himself going to the bathroom in the cool chamber. So they waited until they were embarrassed and, they st and still he had not opened the doors of the upper room. Therefore they took <coughs> finally they took the key and opened the doors and there was their master fallen dead on the floor. But Ehud had escaped while they delayed and passed beyond the stone images and escaped to Sarah. And it happened when he arrived there that he blew the trumpet in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains. And he led them as a mighty army. And he said to them, Follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan River, leading to Moab. And they did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor, stout warriors, not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued under Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years, a generation. And after him came Shangar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. But verse 4 says, When Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan. God gave them up to their enemies, you see. That's what's happening in America today. God is giving our nation up into the hands of our enemies. Make no mistake. Barack Obama is an enemy of the American way of life. He is becoming a virtual dictator. He, uh, he, he is un-American in his approach, but he believes in power, his own power. And he's been elected president, and now the American people are going to see what happens when you elect a foreigner, a Gentile, to be the king. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hatzor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who dwelt in Herosheth Hagoyim. And again the children of Israel did what they wanted to do. They cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron, and for 20 years he had reigned harshly, oppressing the children of Israel. Now during that time, the leader of Israel was Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lepido. She was judging Israel. She was a prophetess. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord of God of Israel 
commanded, Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor. Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and Zebulun. And against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army with his chariots and his <coughs> multitudes at the river Kishon. And I will deliver him into your hand. God is saying this to Deborah and Barak of Israel. And Barak said to her, Well, Deborah, if you go with me, I'll go. Then I'll go. But if you will not go with me, I'm not going to do it. He was a weakling. Now she picked him, so he was the best of a rotten, running litter. And he was a weakling. He wouldn't do it without her going with him to hold his hand, to encourage him. And Barak said to her, If you go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I, I, won't, I just won't go. I won't do it. And so she said to him, All right, Barak, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking. For the Lord will sell Sisera, the captain of Jabin's host, the commander-in-chief, into the hands of a woman, not your hands. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, went up with 10,000 men under his command and Deborah went up with him to give him a little backbone a little spunk now Heber the Kenite of the children of Hobab the father-in-law of Moses had separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent near the terebinth tree at Zanaim which is beside Kadesh and they reported to Cicero that Barak, the son of Abinadab, had gone up to Mount Tabor. So Cicero gathered together all of his chariots, 900 iron chariots, and all the people that were with him from Herosheth by Goyim to the river Kishon. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go up. This is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone up before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him, charging down the sides of the mountain, gathering speed, running, dashing forward. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Hage, Harosheth, Hargoyim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a single man was left. However, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of a woman by the name of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me. Do not fear. And when he had turned aside with her into the tent, she welcomed him and covered him with a blanket and made goo-goo eyes at him, made him feel safe and confident. And he said to her, 
please give me a little water to drink for I'm thirsty and she opened a jug of milk and gave him a drink and covered him and he said to her stand at the door of the tent and if any man comes and inquires of you and says is there any man hiding here and you shall say no there's no man here then Jael the Hebrew's wife took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him Sisera and drove the peg into his temple and it went down into the ground for he was fast asleep and very weary and so he died and then as Barak pursued Sisera Jael came out to meet him and said to him come I will show you the man whom you seek and when he went into her tent there lay Sisera dead with the peg in his temple. So on that day God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. God intervened. God allowed them to go into captivity he sent them into captivity. But when they cried out to him, he intervened and delivered them through Deborah and Barak. The name Barak means lightning. And he led his forces like lightning from the Mount Tabor against the hosts of Sisera. And chapter 5 gives us a perspective of what times were like in Israel in those days. This is a song, <coughs> the song of Debron and Barak, the son of Abinoam. Debron and Barak sang on that day, saying, When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, give of themselves, sacrifice of themselves, Bless the Lord. In other words, when someone gives of himself his time, his energy, his life to serve God and serve God's people and serve in God's work, blessed be the name of the Lord. Because they will be blessed for doing that. God himself will bless them and bless the work. Sometimes I think people think they need to get recognition from me or a pat on the back from me. They want human approval sometimes. They want some evidence that I appreciate them. Well, my wife might agree with that. <laughs> you know, she likes to know that I love her. That's understandable. But there's a problem here because Paul says in Galatians chapter 1 <coughs> he says I don't seek to please men but the Lord who called me and David says in the Psalms promotion doesn't come from the men from the east or the west or the south but promotion, recognition, respect, honor is a gift from God. And if people do the right thing, God will show them honor and give them respect and recognition and a reward someday. But if they want honor, respect, and recognition from me, they're barking up the wrong tree. They should be seeking honor that comes only from God, not from men. If they serve in God's work, they'll get repaid and blessed and honored and exalted by God himself. God is the one who raises up people and puts people down. 
God is the one who replaces people and brings people in to replace the ones that he got rid of. God is the one who respects repentance. You know, if God was ever going to replace anybody, you know, he might have been tempted to replace David. Because David went and committed adultery with a beautiful woman. But she was the wife of one of his trusted soldiers. One of the 300 leading mighty men of Israel. Uh, not 300, 30. <coughs> the Hittite. He was one of the chief 30 fighting men of Israel in the army of Joab. He was a prince of a soldier. And David slept with his wife. That wasn't bad enough. The woman conceived and was with child. And David couldn't deny it much longer. So he plotted to bring, I think his name was Gitta. Is that it? Gitta? Back from the front, the war front. Cappy should know. She just read it recently. Not the right. Anyway, Uzziah, okay. Uzziah, well, they get different names. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he, David brought him back from the war front, mm -hmm. and he came in to visit his wife to have lunch or something with King David, and David asked him how things were going at the, in the war, at the war front, and he told him, and then he said, well, now you should go and uh, go home and stay with your wife overnight or a while and take a couple of days off then go back to the war front. Well, the Hittite went home but he would not sleep with his wife. He just wouldn't do it. He said, why should I sleep with my wife and all my confederates and soldiers are out on the firing line? It's not fair to them. So he refused to sleep with his wife. So now she was still pregnant and David was very embarrassed, so he wrote a secret letter to Joab, the commander of his army, saying, go up to the walls of the city you're besieging, and have the Hittite go with the for in the forefront, and then while he's there, retreat from him, and the Lord's will be done. So Joab knew what was afoot, at least partly, and he did what David said, and they rushed up to the city walls, and several men were killed. And David got the, the dispatch, the report, and was angry, said, why did you go so close to the wall? And Joab said, well, now notice uh, your servant, the Hittite, is also dead. And so David let it go. But God sent his prophet Nathan after that to David to rebuke him for what he had done. And David was so overwrought because of this that he repented in dust and ashes. He repented to the bottom of his heart. He was just anguished. It was Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite. David had him murdered and had committed adultery. But God forgave him. Because David really repented. He repented in, like I said, to the bottom of his heart. Psalm 51 describes the anguish, the pain, the turmoil that was in David's heart after this transgression. We all sin. We all transgress. Any one of God's people can, so, so to speak, fall from grace. Make a huge mistake. But they can repent and be forgiven. If they really repent. Saul, King Saul, could have repented. In fact, but he did not. He pretended to repent. 
he wanted Samuel to stay with him to show him honor after he had sinned. But he didn't repent or stop sinning. But when David was caught red-handed, so to speak, when David was found out, as Moses said in the book of the law, be sure your sin will find you out. That's a lesson we should all learn. Be sure your sin will find you out. You cannot mock God and get away with sinning because God will make it evident, make it plain. Even shout it from the housetops. But if we just truly, genuinely repent, then God will forgive as he forgave David. David suffered because of that sin. His whole house suffered after that. He was, his son Absalom rebelled against him after that. David went through trials and tests, but he was forgiven. And the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. So if even David could sin and then repent and be forgiven and be called even then a man after God's own heart, because he sought, he strove earnestly to walk with God, to stay close to God, to overcome the flesh and the sins of human pride and dignity and envy and self-promotion and lust and all the sins of the human heart. Well, <clears throat> so Deborah and Barak sang this song of praise to the God of Israel. Verse 3 of chapter 5. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord and sing praises to the Yahweh, God of Israel. The Yahweh, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled, and the heavens poured. The clouds poured water, and the mountains gushed before the Lord. This Sinai, before the Lord, Yahweh God of Israel. In the days of Shangar, son of Anath, who was the judge of Israel after Ehud had been judged, in the days before, or during the days of Deborah and Barak. And so verse 6, it says, In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted. Travelers walked along the byways. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel. They were having hard times, massive unemployment. People were walking, looking for work. The highways were deserted. Commerce was at a standstill. It's like the Great Depression of Obama that we're headed into because of financial hocus pocus in the economy of America today. Things are getting worse. The economy is, there's 20 signs today that the economy is retreating to what it was in 2008 when the current depression began. And the dollar is losing its value. Well, in ancient Israel, village life ceased until Deborah arose, a mother in Israel. They chose new gods in Israel. The people were choosing new pagan foreign gods like America today, Hinduism, witchcraft in the military, Muslim, <coughs> Muslim mosques dotting the country of America, Britain, Germany, Europe, France. <coughs> 
within a generation, the way things are going, all these countries will be Muslim, with Muslim majorities, because they're out producing the Caucasians and the whites. New gods were entering into Israel. It says they chose new gods, just like America today. The U.S. federal servants are saying, you cannot speak evil of Muhammad or the Muslim religion. You can't say anything derogatory unless you want to be hauled in before the courts and sent to prison for defaming another religion. Now what about Christians trying to preach the truth, calling paganism paganism, calling a spade a spade, saying Allah is a false god, a moon god of Saudi Arabia? Well, they call that a hate crime, the way things are going. The truth of God they'll call a hate crime if you publish or speak the truth of God. New gods are rising up. Then there was war in the gates, it says, gates of Israel. War in the gates of the cities. Terrorism was striking. Like the Boston Massacre. And there are terrorist cells scattered throughout our country today, waiting to rise up. Then there was war in the gates. Not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. What does that remind you of? Obama's gun control legislation. He's taking away the guns. It was announced this week that Obama's going to sign on to the United Nations Gun Control Treaty, where private citizens of nations are denied firearms. That's like it was in ancient Israel in the days of the judges. It says not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 men in Israel. They had their own gun control legislation, but then they were controlling the spears and the bows and the arrows. Today it's firearms. And Deborah and Barak sang, My heart is with the rulers of Israel, who offered themselves. They were willing to die for the faith, for patriotism, for the people. It says, My heart is with the rulers of Israel, who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. For true leaders, for those who stand up against the machine, the Obama corruption, those who stand up against IRS gate and the Benghazi disaster and the snooping into private emails and telephone calls. Bless the Lord, Deborah said. Speak, you who rode, who ride on white donkeys, you judges and pastors, who sit in judges' attire, and who walk along the road, far from the noise of the archers, among the watering places. There they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord. God's power, his miracles, and his deliverance. The righteous acts of the Lord for his villagers, his people scattered in Israel. Then the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away. O son of a Benoam. Then the survivors came down, the people against the nobles. The Lord came down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim were those 
whose roots were in Amalek. The Amalekites were influencing some of the people of ancient Ephraim. America today is modern Ephraim. And some of our people have their roots in the Amalekites, the Palestinians. And one such appears to be President Barack Obama. He has a Palestinian as one of his forebears, a grandmother. Right after you, Benjamin, with your peoples from Maker of Manasseh, rulers came down, and from Zebulun, those who bear the recruiter's staff. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. As is Issachar, so was Barak, sent into the valley under his command. Among the divisions of Reuben, the French, there was great resolves of heart. The French then were like the French are today. France, Reuben, with a heart like water, debating philosophy when they should have been taking action. The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. To do or not to do, to fight or not to fight. What shall we do with all the Muslims in France? They couldn't make up their minds. They weren't decisive. That's why Reuben couldn't be the leading tribe of Israel, even though they were the firstborn. Gilead stayed around beyond the Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships or continued at the seashore and stayed by his inlets? Zebulun is a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death. Naphtali also on the heights of the battlefield. They fought bravely, valiantly. The kings came down and fought. The kings of Canaan fought in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no spoils of silver, verse 19. They fought from the heavens during these battles in ancient Israel. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. Meteorites came down from the skies bombarding the pagan armies <coughs> like the hailstones mentioned in the book of Revelation in the day of the Lord which is fast approaching. The torrent of Kaishan, the river, swept the soldiers away. The ancient torrent, O oh my soul, march in strength. Then the horse's hooves pounded, the galloping, galloping of his steeds. Curse Miro, said the angel of the Lord. Or the angel of the Lord, the one that became the Messiah the Logos of the Old Testament. So these were conditions in ancient Israel, just like they are today. And our people are just beginning to realize how cursed our nation has become by turning our back on God and inviting in foreign gods. God of gods of Muhammad and the Hindus and witchcraft in the military and Christians are being put down and abased and threatened not to speak about Christ not to bear witness to the truth and our nation is going down 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 into captivity to the new world order and we need to cry out to God as Israel did then, and ask him to strengthen us and give us the strength of heart and the strength of soul, the strength of spirit, to endure to the end, to obey him, and to cry out and shout the message, to lift up our voice with strength, to cry aloud and spare not, as God says 
in Isaiah 58, verses 1 through 2. Cry aloud and spare not, and show my people their transgressions, and the house of Jacob their sins. Christ is coming soon. And then we can lift up our eyes with hope and with redemption right around the corner. Brethren, let's concentrate on really serving God faithfully and pull together, yoke together to finish the work and don't let anyone, any disappointment cause you to swerve from the goal, the purpose, and the job that God has given us to do at this time. Praise God for his mercy. Praise God for his calling. Praise God for his spirit. And praise God for his truth. And praise God that he's called a few in this day and age to sound the trumpet. Amen. Amen.